Good morning. Welcome. Thanks so much for bringing the church into these rooms. It's so good to be together on a chilly morning. Fall has arrived in Central Florida, which I'm happy about. I can see many of you are bundled up. You got scarfs, earmuffs, turtlenecks. And we are here as the church. We've been distributed as the church all week long, distributed in our neighborhoods, in our communities, and in our work. But now we get to be gathered together as the church and we worship. That's what we do when we gather. Our purpose is to worship God for who he is and for what he's done. And today we worship Christ as the source of life. He gave his life so that we might have life. We're not a people that have it all together, but rather we're a people that have been saved by grace, grafted in to the family of God by what Christ has done for us. And we celebrate that in everything we do, and that's why we're here. It's so good to be together. We're also gathered by many folks that are joining us around the world as well. Welcome to all of you. I do want to welcome several of the groups that are with us. Of course, Mount Dora and Oviedo are with us, being greeted by their site pastors right now. But I do want to welcome uh, some of the other groups. Welcome to the Home Church in Ponce Inlet. Also the Home Church in Austin, Texas. Glad you all are joining us. And then we have our friends at the Seminole County Correctional Facility, the Tomoka Correctional Institution, and the Polk Correctional Institution. So glad you're a part of our family. And then we have many uh, individuals. Let me just welcome a few of you by name. First, I want to welcome Eileen in Sandwich, Massachusetts. That makes me hungry. Welcome to you, Eileen. So glad you're joining us this morning. Also, welcome to Lori in Clinton, Connecticut, and to um, Jeff in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, welcome to Karen in Grant, Nebraska. Glad you're with us, Karen. Um, Bill in Aruba, roughing it in Aruba. Glad you're with us, Bill. Um, also welcome to our friend Caitlin in Indonesia. Glad you're with us, Caitlin. And um, there was, uh, where did you go? There was somebody else. Young Hee in South Korea. So glad you're with us, Young Hee. And many, many more. Would you join me in welcoming all of our friends online? Those of you online, in case you didn't realize it, your web minister this morning is Mike Walker. He's a good man and would love to help you. So if you need anything, he's the guy to connect with. Also, after the sermon this morning, Pastor Joel is going to do a time of question and answer. And you can send your questions in to askapastor at northlandchurch.net, and we'll be sure to get those questions. Also, we're going to celebrate uh, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper a little later, and so I would love for you to get your elements uh, now, and so you can be ready when we get to that part of the service. Again, so grateful that you all are joining us this morning. Well, those of you here in Longwood, I do want to make sure that you either got a worship guide or that you will get one on your way out. Uh, there's a lot of information in that uh, about some upcoming events, things that are uh, happening around here, and so we want you to know what's happening so you can connect into the life of what's going on right here. And so be sure to do that. Uh, one thing to mention, and many of you saw this on your way in, the Bloodmobile is here. They'll be here all morning, and they want your blood. And so if you have some time after the service, I'd encourage you to do that. It's a great way for us to serve our community together. But right now, we need to look around and be able to welcome those who are right around us. Would you stand and meet and greet one another? to break it up, but I have to. You can go ahead and take a seat. I want to welcome Oviedo. You're joining us now. So glad you're uh, with us. Well, there's one more thing that I want to mention uh, for all of us this weekend. The first Sunday of November is what we call Orphan Sunday. It's something that we acknowledge here at Northland and many churches across the country do, as well as uh, those across the world. We acknowledge Orphan Sunday because we acknowledge what God calls us to be as the church, to be people who take care of the orphans. 
That's the very heart of God. And so all weekend long, back in the hub here at Longwood, and uh, I believe at the hub at Oviedo, you can talk to Pastor Jeremy about that, but there will be folks there who would love to tell you about the ministries that are going on and uh, ministries about adoption and foster care. And here are three things that I would encourage you to go back and to find out about. First thing is this, just awareness, to learn a little bit more about adoption and foster care. In fact, there are over 100,000 kids here in the U.S. who are in the foster care system waiting to be adopted. You can find out more about that when you go back there. The second thing is there are ways for us to support families who adopt and the families who are part of foster care. And so you can find out about that. And then the third thing is this, those of you who are beginning to feel led to adopt, I'd encourage you this morning to go back and learn a little bit more about it so they can help you as you begin that journey and that process. Because as I mentioned, we do this for two reasons. One, the first reason is it's what God wants us to do. And the second reason, it is an incredible picture of the gospel, of what Christ has done for us, that we have been adopted into his family. And so for our call to worship, I wanna read a scripture that brings that focus for us. So let me invite you to bow your heads and listen to these words carefully. This is Ephesians 1, verses three through six. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son, Jesus. Amen.
words are amazing as they remind us of our foundation, the foundation we have as the church, the foundation we have as Christians, 
the foundation of our soul. Those words come from the Apostles' Creed, an ancient creed that the church has declared together for centuries, reminding each other of their foundation, reminding each other of the one we depend upon, who is Christ. That's the passage we're going to be looking at this morning together in, in John 15 as we continue to go through the Gospel of John. It teaches us about dependence on Christ. In fact, Jesus says these words in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, I in him. He it is who bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus tells us those words, apart from me, you can do nothing, because our propensity is to lean towards self-reliance. Your propensity, mine, is to try to do it myself, get my act together, be good enough. But Jesus invites us to another way, to the way of what he has done for us. He's done everything. That's what this table is all about. Just as a branch relies upon its vine and its stem to bring nutrients out of the ground for life, you and I depend, utterly depend, upon Christ to bring the very life of God into our hearts. Scripture tells us that we are partakers of the divine nature. By the power of the Spirit within us, Jesus gives us the joy that He has enjoyed with the Father for all eternity. And we're here to be reminded of that. The 19th century preacher Andrew Murray writes these words. He says, you are the branch. You need be nothing more. You need not for one single moment of the day take upon you the responsibility of the vine. You need not leave the place of entire dependence and unbounded confidence. We have great confidence when we come to this table, when we remember what Christ has done for us on our behalf. We depend upon him for salvation and we depend upon him for sanctification. It's a churchy word, but it simply means that we progressively are being made more and more like Jesus. We're being made into a people that bear fruit. And it begins with being honest before God. And so we're going to pray a prayer of confession together. You'll see this on the screen. Would you pray these words with me? Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, mind, and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may abide in you, delight in your will, and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. I want to invite the communion servers to get into position now. Let me give some basic instructions of how this will go. You will be invited row at a time by the ushers, and you'll make your way to the station closest to you. And you'll take a piece of bread, and you'll dip it in the cup of your choice. The lighter liquid is juice, and the darker liquid is wine. And you'll dip it in one of those cups and partake immediately and head back to your seat. If some reason you're not able to make your way to one of those stations, just simply raise your hand and somebody will be to, to you in a moment with a tray to, to give you those elements. Parents and guardians, I invite you to do, to instruct your children of what to do in this time as we celebrate this sacrament together. For those of you who don't know Jesus, you've never had a relationship, a personal relationship with him, I would ask that you wouldn't take this meal because it's not going to mean anything to you. But you can know him this morning. And I would invite you, if that is you, to go back to the, the back of this room. And there are folks there who would love to pray with you, and to introduce you to Jesus, and then they would love to serve you these elements so you can partake of Christ this morning. And so if that's you, I'd invite you any time during this time to go back to the back of the room. But for all of us, let me remind you of the words the Apostle Paul records in 1 Corinthians 11. This is what he writes. 
The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Friends, for as often as we eat this bread and drink the cup, We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. So let me invite you, as you are dismissed, to come and to commune with Christ, abide in Christ, and to commune with one another. Come as you are dismissed.
stand and let's make this our prayer together. together this ancient prayer. Christ, Christ be with, with me. Christ, Christ within me. Christ behind me. Christ before me. Christ beside me. Christ to win me. Christ to comfort and restore me. Christ beneath me. Christ above me. Christ in quiet. Christ in danger. Christ in hearts of all that love me. Christ in mouth of a friend and a stranger. I bind unto myself the name, the strong name of the Trinity, by invocation of the same, the three in one and one in three, by whom all nature hath creation, eternal Father, Spirit, Word. Praise to the Lord of my salvation. Salvation is of Christ the Lord. I love this time. This is our family. No matter where you're located in the world, this is our family. And so um, after a family meal, let's have a family discussion. First of all, I love uh, the fact that this is Orphan Sunday. We were all orphans. The Bible says we were strangers and aliens until we were adopted into the family of God. So I want to encourage um, any of you who are even thinking about adoption or foster care um, to get involved. You know, if one family in every three churches in America would adopt the kids that are up for adoption, there would be no kids in the system. One family in every three churches. And we have lots of families here who have done that. So, so I want to encourage you toward that. But then I want to continue the family conversation I've been having. I told you before how guilty I feel. <laughs> we don't do guilt here, but, you know, there's still a little, uh, you know, God has jerked me uh, by the, the neck in a, after 43 years of ministry. And I told you before, I, I, I just, I was raised in a, in a culture where you don't talk about money. And so I, now, I haven't for 43 years. And finally, God came to me and said, why are you not teaching about this most central principle for spiritual life in your people. And, and, and I kind of got excited about it. 
You know, when, when the Lord comes to you, by the way, it doesn't make you drag, it kind of quickens you, kind of quickens your spirit. And a few weeks ago, I told you, um, and I'm not gonna, you know, um, I'll just give you a little bit of the time, because that's just how I did. So a few weeks ago, I said that God's all about intimacy. He wants a relationship. But there's no intimacy. The first principle of any relationship is this. There is no intimacy without investment. There is no intimacy without investment. That's why Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. God's goal is our heart, but investment is his means. And then a couple of weeks ago, I said to you, you know, again, when we, when we consider what we're gonna do with our money, that's what's valuable to us. If, you, if I could see where you spend your money, I would know exactly what's valuable to you, exactly. And so, and so we wanna spend it in the place where it has the highest impact. And if you're talking about eternal impact, there's no place where you could spend it with a higher eternity. The Bible says that there are, there's places you can plant that fruit comes up and it, and it multiplies 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. This is a 100-fold plant soil here. And so for those of you who like to think, I want to have the highest impact, this is it. But I, but I want to tell you something else. <laughs> um, Dave Ramsey, you know Dave Ramsey, the Financial Peace University guy, invited us, about 30 of us, uh, in leading churches across the country um, up in Nashville where his headquarters are last week. Just wanted to love on us and, and appreciate us. And, and, and so, you know, I'm thinking, oh God, I, I don't, I, this is my weak area. I don't want to go there. All these people know about this stuff. I don't know, about, you know. So I went anyhow, but, um, and Becky went with me and it was wonderful. And, uh, but as we were gathering together, uh, they, they were saying a couple of things. First of all, I knew I was the chief sinner in the room because all of those had, had, had consistently taught on stewardship their whole ministry. And, and one even said, who would not, tell me a pastor who would not give at least one stewardship series in a year. <laughs> and I just go, oh man, I gotta tell you guys something, you know. Try 44 years, you know, and they go, what? So anyhow, but one of the pastors in the room was Bill Hybels, and some of you know that name, he's a Willow Creek, and he's a neat guy, and, and uh, just solid as a rock. And they were all swapping ideas about, about what made sense to their congregations. Bill said, hey, let me tell you, let me tell you what I, I said to my congregation a little while ago that made sense to many of them. And, 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 and what happened was, first of all, I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw this out again. Um, um, he said, I, I said there are two groups of people who have to go from um, A to B in their finances. A is the starting point. And in the middle here is all of your expenses, all of how you spend your money. It's, it's your family, it's, and it's good stuff, good stuff. And there's another group has to go from A to B also. Um, and, but, but he said, the difference is, these are non-tithers. Um, tithe, uh, wait, I always, I always do that. Okay, I gotta erase this, okay. These are non-tithers. And they, they just do the math. And they got, they say, you know, tithe by the way means 10th. So you give a 10th of your income, specifically to the Lord. I'll show you that scripture in just a minute. So there's the nine tithers and they say, you know, I love God and I'll give to him whenever I can. But doing the math, I need 100% of what I bring in to go from A to B. Just gotta tell you, gonna be honest about it. And I know that doesn't keep me out of heaven, God doesn't love me any less, so I just gotta be honest, that's, that's, that's how it looks to me. The second one are the tithers. Tithe, I did the same thing. <laughs> tithers. And they look at this and they say, you know, I know what God says. And God says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse. And, and, and see if I don't open the windows of heaven. So you know what? I'm gonna discipline myself to trust God, even though I don't understand the math. I don't see how the math is gonna come out. But I'm gonna trust God. And I'm going to go from A to B as well as I can. I may have to adjust B, but I'm gonna go as well on 90%. Now, let me tell you what happens. 
First of all, when it says in Malachi 3.10, and this is what it says, and I want to use a different color here. It says, bring the whole tithe, 10, the 10%, into the storehouse. Storehouse was an actual physical room in the temple. Um, it's in Nehemiah uh, 3.10 and other, other passages. Um, but, um, or in Nehemiah, I'm sorry, 10.38 and in other passages. Uh, but that there may be food in my house. Now this is the only place in the whole Bible where it says this. Test me in this. This is God talking to you. I'm not talking, by the way, to the whole group of wherever you are. I'm talking to you personally. Personally. This is, don't think about the person next to you. This is for you personally. God is saying, test me in this, all right? It's the only place in all the Bible says, where he says, test me. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven. The floodgates of heaven, the windows of heaven, and it says in some verses. And pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Now, let's go back. To the tithers, this is what Bill said, what made tremendous sense to me. They don't just go to A to B, from A to B. They go to C. There's a C in their life. That's what those blessings are. That's what the windows of heaven are. There's a C in their life. Now, what, what is the C? That's what I want you to discover. If you're not a tither, I want you to see what that blessing is. Is it financial? Is it relational? Is it, is it uh, achievement? Is it, is it, uh, is it, it's certainly spiritual. But what is the C? Now here's what I want you to see about God. God doesn't punish us. He doesn't come hunting us down and go, hey, where's my 10%? But if he has a blessing for you that, 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 is, that is connected with finances, you won't get it without the C. Where would, he, where would he hide the specific blessings for you? Where would he put them? He would put them in some place that requires faith, wouldn't he? Because what does he want to build in you? Faith. That's why John was written. It says in John chapter 20, verse 30, I have written these things that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God and have life, the life that he offers. God has this blessing of life for you and he wants you to have it. But we won't have it until we exercise the faith that says, okay, God, I'm just gonna do this. You said to do it, I'm gonna do it. You made, you made the blessings, the windows of heaven conditional on my testing you, I'm gonna do it. And so that's, that's the lesson I have for you right now. That, that God wants for us to have this blessing, but we need to exercise the faith. And when you do that, it's not up just about the math. The math will never work out, by the way. That's what the kingdom's like. It never adds up. It never, only in the kingdom is subtraction addition. You know, it just doesn't, it doesn't add up math wise. But God wants you to show, to show you how dependable he is and what he has for you because you have exercised your faith. Okay, now let me go to the text for this weekend. And it's about pruning. <laughs> this is going to be rather unpleasant. By the way, I don't have a lot of, I don't have a lot of uh, stories for you this time. I'll tell you stories every once in a while, but I'm, I'm making a little switch. And here's the little switch. Um, I, I, I'm not nearly so concerned with entertaining you as I am to assuming that you have come into this room because you want to change your life and make it better. Because you want for what God has for you. And so therefore, I'm going to give you the straight dope, okay? I'm going to, I'm going to teach you uh, in ways of substance. Um, I will always tell stories because I love to tell stories. But, but I don't, I don't that doesn't, that's not the central part of the message anymore. Central part of the message is this is what God says. This is what you need to know. And if you apply these things, you'll have a totally different life. Jesus starts out in John chapter 15 like this. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Now, 
But many times we start out in here, we come to worship God for who he is. Who is God? Well, this is how Jesus describes um, 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 his role and the Father's role. He says, I am the true vine. Now, let me stop just for a moment. I want to show you something very significant that he would be saying to the Jewish people who he was talking to. Because the Jewish people have always assumed that Israel was the vine. That's one of the ways that God described Israel. As a matter of fact, it says in Jeremiah, I think it's chapter 2, verse 21. That's it. Jeremiah 2, 21. This is what it says. God is speaking to Israel. And he's saying to Israel, yet I planted you a choice vine, a completely faithful seed. How then have you turned yourself before me into the degenerate shoots of a foreign vine? So Israel went off the rails. He can't, God called this community together to be the means of blessing the whole world. Genesis 12, 3. Remember that? And they went off the rails. All right, now watch this. So when Christ says, I am the true vine, what's he saying? He's not replacing Israel. He's fulfilling Israel. He's saying Israel will be fulfilled through me. Every nation of the world will be fulfilled through me. Nobody replaces Israel. But this is Christ is the fulfillment of that prediction of that blessing of the whole world. And we are in that vine. All right. Now, so it says in, in, in um, um, John chapter, chapter one, uh, chapter 15, verse one, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. <laughs> you know what that is, don't you? The pruner. My father is the one who comes with scissors. This isn't going to be pleasant for you. But there's a purpose that will be joyous. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit. What is fruit? Fruit, just think of what a, what a grape is in, in, the, in, in, the, in the vine thing. It's, it's something of benefit to someone else. So fruit is every good work that you do, watch this, that also has a spiritual impact. Every good work that you do that shows who you are in Christ, but also because of that has a spiritual impact. That's fruit. And so he says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, cuts it out. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. Skip down to verse 8. This is what it says. My father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit. You know, any of you who are good at anything, God loves that. You, you should never be ashamed of that. There was, there was a, 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 a guy in this group that I, last week that was worth, I don't know, 50, 60 million dollars. And he said something that just bowled me over. He said, you know, many times the church shames rich people. The church shames rich people. That kind of, kind of set me back, you know? Listen, if you've got money, good for you. Enjoy it. That's a gift from God. We just want you to know why you've got money. All right? But this is not about being ashamed. This is not about being ashamed of anything you're good at. Don't hide your light under a bushel for crying out loud. All of us have been given gifts in order to bless other people. This, my father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So let's, let's stop right here and just think for a moment. How many varieties in everybody who's worshiping with us this morning, how many varieties of fruitfulness and good works are there? You know, there's a horticulturalist at the uh, University of Minnesota that has done a study on how many varieties of grapes there are. Watch this. 12,000 varieties of grapes. 
I thought there was purple and green. <laughs> I, that's, that's, all, that's, that's what I thought there was, you know? 12,000 varieties of grape. Do you know how many different ways God blesses this world through your life? Uniquely through your life. And so it's really important that we understand not only are you a blessing, but you're the kind of blessing that points people toward heaven. You know, in the temple, in the temple, there was this, Josephus wrote this, he was, one of, he was a Jewish historian. And he said, there was this sculpture, this huge gold sculpture of these people bringing back the clusters of grapes from the promised land. They were as big as a man. That's how big those clusters were. I want you to know that when you bless this world, that it's really, you're doing it from heaven. You're bringing back the fruit of heaven, literally, in order to point them toward the promised land. That's how God uses it. When we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's exactly what we're praying. And so it's important for us to understand why this is so important to God. But it's also important to us to understand why this isn't always easy and natural for us and why God has to prune us sometimes. And it's always out of a relationship of love. You have to, you have to understand that. As a matter of fact, in, in, in Hebrews uh, chapter 12, he talks about uh, how uh, the father disciplines the son. This is what it says. It says, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. That's one type by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and he scourges every son whom he receives. Now you parents know this, don't you? Your first word to your kids is, cut that out. Or you need to go do this. That is a word of reproof. All right? Now if the kid does it, great. Everything's peaceable. What if the kid doesn't do it? After you've said it many times, what if the kid doesn't do it? Then discipline kicks in. Then you get uncomfortable and you get frustrated and you get kind of angry inside. What if that doesn't do it? Then it's scourging. Something's gonna be painful. Something's gonna be painful. Those are the three degrees of pruning that God does because he loves us and he sees in us what we don't see in ourselves. He sees great potential, just like a parent sees it in a kid, that's what God sees in us. And so what's he gonna do? Well, Jesus goes on to say in here, first of all, he's gonna come to you and he's gonna cut out the dead wood. He's, now, the dead wood here means sin, barrenness, barrenness. Do you know why? Because everybody knows in any plant that what is dead, becomes a host for disease to infect the rest of the plant. And so therefore, God's first order of business is to subtract from us our sin. Subtract from us our sin or make us pretty miserable in it or because of it. And that's part of the subtraction. But then he goes on to say this. He goes on to say, that even those that are producing fruit, he comes and prunes even more. Now, again, there's two varieties of pruning here. One is voluntary with us, and one is involuntary on us. Two different types of pruning in order to produce more fruit. Now, let me, let me, let me go into this just a little bit. When you look at a, when you look at a, a, a vine or a, or a, a vineyard, um, you might think that the natural thing that that, that, that vine does, remember, <clears throat> Christ is the vine, we're the branches, right? A, a vine or a branch is much more inclined to produce more wood and more leaves than it is more fruit much more inclined, just left to itself, 
it will produce more wood, that is more vine, more structure. You're, you're, in your life, how much structure you got? Structure begets structure, all right? So just given, given our schedules, we're, 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 we're scheduled up. We're structured, I've got, I've got to do this now, now I've got to do this, now I've got to do this, now I've got to do this. Let me ask you, how much of that is really fruitful? How much of that is really fruitful? So what will happen is, you will, you, all of us will provide more structure because we think somehow that's gonna produce more fruit. It doesn't. Let me, let me ask you very simply. Don't, you don't have to ask your, you don't have to raise your hands or anything on this. How many of you are now in commitments that at one time made a great deal of sense, they don't make any sense anymore? But you keep on doing it. You even ask yourself before you do it, why am I still doing this? Why am I still doing this? And you can't really answer the question. Now, here's a good, here's a good measuring device. If you go ahead and do it and you ask yourself after You've done it. Why am I still doing this? That's not making any difference at all. You know you've got structure and not fruit. If you go ahead and do it and you say afterwards, oh, now I remember why I did it. Because I did have an impact there. That's a, that's a keeper. That's worth keeping. Now I remember why I'm doing it. Then that's producing fruit. So God calls on us to cooperate with his pruning in order to cut out the activities and the relationships and the expenditure of our thoughts and our time in ways that are not fruitful, that are not fruitful. And by the way, if you look at a, at a, um, 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 a vine where a branch goes into the vine, remember we're the branches, he's the vine. And where that joins, uh, any 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 um, 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 vine dresser would tell you this. That is the most likely place for there to grow sucker shoots. You know what a sucker shoot is? A sucker shoot is this little green thing that comes out. This little shoot that comes out that looks like it has great potential, but it ends up just being more leaves. And so not only will the vine dresser go and start to cut out the dead wood that will impede greater fruit, he'll cut out the decorations. He'll cut out that which looks pretty, but really doesn't help us to, to do what we are still here to do. And that is to live lives of holiness and to, and to produce, produce spiritual fruit in the world. And so, and so, again, you gotta ask yourself, what do I do that just kind of looks good, but it doesn't really do anything? How, how much am I, am I paying attention to my life so that it, it's more presentable and it looks better, but I know it's really not producing any fruit? Because, again, that's what the vine dresser wants to cut out. Now, one more. He'll go to a part of a vine in order to prune, that, that is producing fruit, and he'll, he'll cut it back harder. Two reasons. First of all, if the vine dresser is really good at what he does, and we know the father's really good at what he does, that pruning ensures that the whole vine is, is producing fruit and not just parts of the vine. See, that's, that's the problem with most organizations right now. There are parts of the organization that produce much, much fruit, but a lot of the organization doesn't. It just doesn't. God's heart is that every part of that vine would produce fruit. Every branch that's left on that vine would produce fruit. And so that's why he keeps pruning. And to those who are producing fruit, he comes and he cuts he cuts deeper. And those people must be thinking, what are you doing? You know, I've been doing my job here. I've been, I've been, I've been living, to, you know, I've been doing my, and, and this is what God says to us. There are going to be things that you don't see to take away. 
But I see that if they're not taken away, that eventually they will become a part of not producing much fruit. There are types of grapes in a vineyard. If you walk in a vineyard, there will be little bitty grapes and, 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 and it looks like fruit, but if you, if you taste them, they don't have much taste. They just look like grapes. God isn't pleased with that. He wants big, juicy, honker fruit, okay? And so, and so he'll, he'll cut those out. There are, there are those, and I hope there are many of us, for whom God says, I'm going to come and take away that which you don't think I should take away. I'm going to come and I'm going to test you. Do you trust me with the people you love? Do you trust me? By the way, Brooke Wilkinson wrote a book, Secrets of the Vine. Get it. It's a great book. Secrets of the Vine. We got it back there. Do you trust me with the people you love? Because I'm going to mess with their lives. I'm not just going to mess with your life. I'm going to mess with their lives. And you've got to trust me that I know what I'm doing. You've got to. He'll come to us and he'll say, do you trust me with things when they don't make any sense to you? Will you trust me with more than you can understand? Because if I can only operate in the part of your life where you understand what I'm doing, I got to tell you, that's a very limited partnership. I'm prepared to do in your life way more than you'll ever be able to ask or even think. That's what I have for you. That's my C for you. But if you insist on understanding, then we'll be, we'll be operating in a very small part of the field. And then I got to ask you, are you willing to trust me? This, this is the stuff that hurts. Are you willing to trust me with never understanding the significance of what I'm doing in your life? You know, a lot of us, me included, get up on many days and we ask ourselves this question. Am I really making any difference in this world? Because we don't feel like we are. It doesn't take many discouraging days before you ask yourself that question. But this is what the great vine dresser would say to you. Are you able to trust me with making your life much more significant than you could ever, ever think of yourself. Because that's what I want. I want you to have this great, great life that you never fully grasped. I want you to have this great life where people will remember you in ways that would astound you. I want you to have this great life that is so much beyond your potential that only comes up to my potential. Let me close with this. George Bernard Shaw, some of you know that name, is a brilliant playwright, brilliant writer. And at the end of his life, somebody asked ask him an interesting question. They said, as you look back over your life, if you could exchange lives with anybody who had ever lived in this world, if you were able to exchange lives with anybody, any other life in this world, whose life would you exchange for the one you have now? And without hesitation, George Bernard Shaw said, I would exchange it for the life that George Bernard Shaw could have lived 
but never did. I'm telling you, there's still time for us to have those lives that God wants for us beyond our understanding, beyond our comfort. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for this scripture and thank you for showing us that you have greater plans for us than what we can understand or what we ourselves can manage. So we ask you to apply this scripture to our minds that we might not grow shallow and apply them to our hearts that we might not grow cold and apply them to our feet that we might be doers of the word and not hearers only. Amen. All right, I talked for a long time this morning, but we got six or seven minutes where we can ask questions. And Tim, you be our facilitator. Yeah. Okay. If any of you have a question regarding the sermon or anything, um, we would uh, love to try to answer those. So just raise your hand and we'll call you. So we'll go to Monica's mic all the way over here on the right first. Hi, um, I was wondering, earlier you were talking about the non-tithers and the tithing. Um, does God expect it for all ages, even if you're like in middle school or high school? And absolutely, absolutely. Tithing, she asked a, a question. Uh, could you put some sound through this? She asked a question um, as to if there is any age um, variance. Uh, on, on tithing? And the answer is absolutely not. If, you, if you're following God, if you're five years old and you get an allowance of a dollar, hopefully your parents teach you, you know, give 10% of that, give 10 cents to God, save, you know, it'd be good if they teach, save 10 cents and you got 80, 80, 80 cents to blow. But, but, uh, <laughs> but there's, there's really no age, um, age limitation or age target for this. It's a, it's a spiritual principle. And so therefore it doesn't matter the amount of money. What matters is that you're following God and God's doing in your life what he wants to do with that aspect of your discipleship. Yeah. Let's go to Sarah's mic there in the back, right? Hey, Pastor Joel, my name is Rihanna, and I know you need to take care of yourself along with others. So when you say God cuts the fruit, which helps others, what will be left for yourself? Well, this is the great thing. Um, um, there's always, if, if you are being productive, then God provides for you. You don't have to worry about providing for yourself. God provides for you. You're attached to the vine. You're a branch, okay? What you produce is for other people, but God will always give you enough that you're provided for because he himself takes care of you. You don't have to take care of you, okay? Okay. Great. Let's go to Robin's mic here, if you'll stand. Thanks. Good morning, Pastor. Uh, my name is Kerry. Um, interestingly enough, I had a conversation this week at work with someone regarding tithing, and my wife and I, we, we believe in tithing and we live by it. But the, what came up was um, tithing is law. Jesus died. He fulfilled the law. Um, how, you know, how do you... Basically, the point was that we don't have to tithe. So my wife and I st did some studying on um, Friday and we found that the... Interestingly, Cain, Abel actually gave the first fruits and there was no law. And then uh, Abraham tied to Melchizedek right. and there was no law in tithing. Right. But the, the main issue is where in the New Testament do we find that you have to tithe 10% of your finances? Matthew 23, 23, Jesus says, um, he's talking to the Pharisees and he says, woe to you who tithe every mint and dill and coming. These things you ought to have done. So he affirms the tithe, but he says also, but in addition to that, your heart was in the wrong place. You need to do it joyfully. You need to have kindness and compassion and so on and so forth. And so uh, the, the, it, the, it's, it's, it's affirmed not as a law, but as a spiritual principle in the New Testament. That's what we're talking about here. That's why we don't do guilt here. Guilt comes with the law. We don't live by guilt. We, we, we live by faith. And, and this is a spiritual principle. Okay. We're going to go to Monica's mic. We've got several here. So, Hey, Pastor Joel. Hi. Um, I'm a little torn about um, in leading life, as you know, bad things happen. And just wondering, how do I distinguish between whether or not it is um, 
caused by God or just allowed by God? I don't know that you can. I don't know you can, Mindy. I, 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 sometimes, you know, we know God, for example, doesn't punish others because of what we've done. That cycle is broken. So if something bad happens to somebody you love, that wasn't caused by God because of you. Uh, in other cases, you know, when you do some dumb things, there are some dumb consequences. So you know that was caused by you. But there's a whole gray area in there that we never know for sure. All we know is that God allows it all so that we can grow from it spiritually and become more than conquerors through it. He does it to make us stronger, not to make us weaker. All right, let's go to Melissa's mic. If you'll stand up, thank you. Hi, Pastor Joe, good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for your wonderful teachings about tithing. I have to say that in the beginning when we became newborn Christians, we were so excited that I felt like removing my earrings, in, you know, gold earrings and just giving as an offering. But then with time, it just other things come. And so thank you so much for reminding us of this wonderful blessing. But my question is kind of, I, I'm, I'm sure it's simple for you, but it's just a puzzle for me. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's, it's, um, the other church that we came in, the other churches that we visit uh, before, they always had the basket going. And I, in the beginning, we, we, we've been here for two years. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, it was like, oh, maybe they forgot. Or, <laughs> you know, it was like, okay. And, then, and I know it's outside. I know that. Yeah. But um, why do you choose, uh, Northland chose to not go with the baskets? I'm sorry to ask you this. No, it's no, just no, something no, that I have in my perfect, mind. <laughs> totally, totally valid question. It really is. And it came from the early days. You know, JT could tell us why. Uh, but in, remember, in the temple, they had boxes also. They didn't pass the hat in the temple. And so there's, there's, there, is a, there is a tradition that goes way back to our, our origins. Um, the American churches did pass long-handled offering baskets. Both are fine, um, but the tradition in this church when I came was not to take up an offering, simply to have boxes available. Um, we talk about this every once in a while mm -hmm. uh, because we want we so want giving to be a part of our worship. It's so important to our worship. Um, and, and many times when you don't have that in, as a part of the worship service per se, it's tough to make the connection. This is my worship of God, you know? Um, so we're still talking about that, but thanks for that. It's a good question. It's a good question. Uh, we have a lot of questions. We just have time for one more. And so for those of you online, Lisha, Sasha, we will answer your questions later. Anyone else here that didn't get their question answered, please write into ask a pastor at northlandchurch.net. And but Robin, we'll take yours for the last one. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you. If you'll stand up, please. Thank you. Hi, my name is Don Regan. I was wondering um, the question about how um, let's say you do trust in God, but the issue with the understanding of why he's doing the things that he's doing in your life, life, you know that he's doing it for a reason, but aren't exactly sure why and how to exactly trust the reasoning. Right. How that's, to that's, the yeah. this, is, this is the key question here. You know, what if I don't understand? How can I understand? And that's where faith comes in. Because... There is so much that happens in this life that we will never understand until we get to heaven. When we get to heaven, we will understand. It says in 1 Corinthians 13, then I will know fully, even as I've been fully known. But there are things in this life where we don't get it. Um, and, and, but, but we don't doubt God. I mean, we know God gets it. We just can't think like God thinks. And that's part of, the, that's part of the, the, the glory of it all. God has reasons larger than we could probably comprehend if he did tell us. Um, it has to do with the future. It has to do with, with uh, you know, things that he's trying to accomplish that have nothing to do with us. Uh, and so there's a, there's a broad kind of, 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 of uh, um, purpose of God that, that sometimes we just won't understand and we just have to trust, you know? We just have to trust. Um, and that's what faith is, not having to understand, 
before you say, okay, God, I know it's there somewhere. If you ever want to tell me, I'd be really interested. Uh, but, but I don't get it. And that's okay. Okay? Is that it? Okay, it is that it. Um, um, every worship service, we give people uh, a chance to just personally receive Christ. Uh, because many, many people believe in Christ, but they've never personally committed their lives to Christ. And so they don't have the assurance that they, that they really, well, God wants them to have. Um, and there's a very simple pray, prayer that you can pray that gives you the assurance, the confidence that you have a personal relationship with God. And so we do this every service. So here's what I want you to do. I want everybody to stand up. We do it a little bit differently. Every service. Same, same thing with, with everybody online. Just stand up if you can. If you can, if you can stand up. If you, if you can't stand up, then don't worry about it because here's what I'm going to have you do. If you'd like to say this prayer with me today, I'd love that. No matter where you are in the world. Um, and by the way, what I talked about giving, you're in the room. You understand? It's, 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 it's as simple for you as it is for us uh, to bring the tithe into the storehouse. So, but um, um, here's what I'd like to do today. If you would like to say this prayer with me, just so that you can be absolutely confident that you are a branch attached to the vine, um, then I'd love to say it with you. Just slip your hand up so I can kind of see who you are. Okay, good, good. And, and those of you who have raised hands, same thing out there. Slip your hand up. That way it won't matter if you're standing or sitting. But, but here's what I want you to do. I want you just to bow and pray this prayer with me. Those of you who have already prayed it, I want you to memorize just the generalities of it. Because there will be people in your life that you need to pray this with that aren't going to come to church. You know, they're in your life for a purpose, and you're the purpose. And so you need to, you, if they ever say, how do I get to, how, how am I confident that I have a relationship with God? You can say, let me pray this prayer with you that helps you give your life to God, and therefore you know you've given your life to God. So those of you who raised your hand, I want you to bow your heads. Everybody bow your heads, both online and in the room. And I just want you to pray this prayer after me personally. And just whisper it out loud. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth, um, Jesus is Lord. And, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. You shall be saved. So go ahead and whisper this as I pray it. Dear God, I know I have sinned by my actions and decisions. And that sin is an indication that I am separate from you. I don't want to live separate from you. Jesus, I know when you died on the cross, you paid for all my sins too. And you offer me the gift of salvation. Today, I accept that gift. And I ask you to come into my heart and be my Lord and my Savior and make of my life whatever you want. In Jesus' name, amen. Congratulations, you just got born again. Those of you with your hands up, good, good for you. It's your spiritual birthday, by the way. Write it down, November 2nd, 2014. Write it down because the evil one's gonna try to get you to doubt. And I want you to be able to pull out the date and go, nope, here it is, right here. I'm with God, get out of my face. Um, <laughs> for those of you who we can help grow in the Lord, that's the next step. We'd love to do that. You have. You have some folks at, uh, at uh, Hub. Those of you online have an online minister. Let us help you. We're family. This is what we do. We grow together in Christ. First time visitors, thanks for coming today. We love having you here. We hope we can be your church family if you're looking for one. Um, also, remember, we got the blood mobile out there. We do this practically every time we have communion because it's his blood that gave us new life. It's our blood that can give others new life. And so it's a perfect uh, duplication of what Christ has done. Uh, well, you know, as well as you can duplicate that. Uh, those of you who are interested in, in adoption um, and, and foster care, we'd love to have that conversation with you. Go to the hub, it's right by nature's table. Uh, and there's also a, a, a table down at this end of the foyer too, I think, or right outside the bookstore. You tell me, outside the bookstore. 
Um, and the last thing is, if you're in the room, we have a prayer team. And if you came in to uh, this place uh, um, with a prayer need or you developed one while I was preaching, we would love to share that with you. The Bible says share one another's burdens. And so we'll be glad to stand with you and pray with you again online. You got an online minister, but, but let's go from the, this place today. Remember that God made you to make a huge impact in this world. If he's pruning you, say, thanks. <laughs> and remember, he's just getting you ready to make a bigger impact that you'll be glad of. Amen.